So thanks to everybody for coming to this talk. My name is Andrew Sutton. Um, the, the presentation today is on Concepts Lite. This is a language feature proposed for C++. Uh, actually, no, sorry, it's not proposed for C++ anything. It is actually part of a ISO technical specification that's new since um, the Bristol meeting. Um, I thought I'd actually start with, with, with this stuff first since it's kind of interesting. So basically, a technical specification is an extension of C++, either the library or the language. This one happens to be a language extension. It's not actually part of C++ until later on. Um, if you want to know more about what tec uh, technical specifications are, there's a really nice description of, of their purpose on the ISO CPP website. This one happens to be based on the document N3580, which was the actual proposal for Concepts Lite um, that was presented at Bristol. So we're hoping to actually deliver this technical spe specification around the same time as C++14. Hopefully there will be compilers that are actually shipping the features at the same time they, they start shipping the major C++14 features also. GCC should. Um, so if you really want to know more about this work, we have a website. The, the first page is kind of static, but there's a wiki attached to it. Um, this is a work in progress. So the information is somewhat incomplete. The information is fairly incomplete, um, but it's, it's getting filled out as, as we go. There, there is an implementation. Uh, actually, there are two implementations. I'm going to point you at this one. I did, put, I did say in my abstract that I would provide a, uh, a GCC-based compiler for this set of features. So I'm going to step outside of the presentation set for a second. If you have your laptop, and your laptop happens to be a Mac or Linux box, you can actually go grab the compiler during this talk and build it, although you will need to apply a particular patch since, uh, since the, the branch you're checking out doesn't actually have all the features that I'm going to be talking about, but the patch has most of them. Um, there are instructions for actually applying the patch and applying a new version of the patch if you've already seen this and, and gotten it and applied it. So I expect to hear computer fans worrying during this presentation while you guys build this. Anybody? No? No takers? Okay. So um, I don't know if this is a 90-minute talk. I think it might be. Um, but feel free to interrupt me and ask me questions anytime. Um, but this is what I'm going to talk about basically in sort of large, large chunks. Um, give a little bit of introduction to why, why concepts light are important. Uh, how you actually constrain templates. How you define the constraints. How the language actually works. Um, some discussion of notation for constraints. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the implementation and then some, some thoughts on programming uh, with, with concepts. So templates are great. We love them. We like them. They let us write nice abstract algorithms in terms of high level, what's the word, uh, concepts like integers, real numbers, sequences, sets, graphs, these kinds of things. Um, they're very general. Al algorithms and data structures written in terms of contract, contract uh, concepts happen to be nicely adaptable to different implementation models. So we're not, we're not locked into a single implementation model with a template. We can obviously have many different implementations that work for the same, the same abstract specification. Um, and one of the nice things about templates, actually one of the great things about templates, is that when we compile them, when we instantiate them, we don't have any abstraction penalty. Um, the, the code that gets generated from template instantiation is roughly what you would actually write by hand and optimize the same way. We can also take advantage of type-based optimizations. I know if you were at Joel's talk yesterday, he talked about how to do some of this stuff with, with the context of SIMD. I think some other people have talked about this, this idea throughout the, present, the, the week also. Unfortunately, you know, we have this ideal, but the, the language doesn't really currently live up to that ideal. We, there are a lot of things that we want to say abstractly and generally and gracefully, and then we have to do stuff like this. Um, so here's a little GCD function written using C++11. It's constrained for uh, integral types, which we write our constraint using enable if um, and accessing to this type member. And then it does some kind of tag-based dispatch if you have an unsigned integer or a signed integer. Um, so ideally, if you use unsigned integers, you can go to a, to a binary GCD. If you use signed integers, you get Euclidean algorithm. So this is not bad. This is actually pretty easy. It's not hard to scale this up for more complicated templates with more complicated requ uh, requirements and get something that's almost virtually unreadable. But people have been getting better at writing these things, so we're, we're not too bad, but I think we can do a little bit better. I hope we can do a little bit better. And unfortunately, if you don't do it all right and your user gives you the wrong types, you're still going to get template spew. I know when I gave this talk at, at the WG21 meeting, um, this is, this is, these are simple errors if you haven't done it correctly. Um, but Mike Spurtis gave a, a nice backstory 
about some template areas. I can't remember what library he was using. It may have been the Boost Graph library. If you've ever used the Boost, Boost Graph library, you're almost certainly familiar with these kinds of messages, but drawn out to the extent. Except that apparently his error messages filled up his disk. <laughs> That's uh, usually not, not a good thing to have happen. But it's a good story to tell. So Concepts Lite tries to address a lot of these features. In particular, we're looking to improve support for generic programming by um, sort of allowing programmers to directly state requirements on the template arguments. We want to be able to check those template arguments at the point of use rather than allowing the instantiation to proceed and you know, diagnose those errors when they, ha when they occur inside of the instantiation. We want to be able to support overloading uh, based on constraints and class template specialization based on those constraints. Um, and really, the, the sort of the, the end goal of this is that we want to be able to improve interfaces and get better diagnostics out of the compiler. We'd also like to be able to do this without runtime overhead. Actually, if we couldn't do this without runtime overhead, it would be a non-starter because their templates are not supposed to have runtime overhead. So that's just kind of a given. But we'd also like to do it without long compilation times. Now, the, the proposal has been almost completely imp implemented twice over um, for various reasons, but they do actually handle, both implementations actually handle the standard library constraints and the algorithms associated with them. So it's, it's fairly capable implementation. Minus, of course, the compiler errors where I haven't checked things appropriately. Modulo bugs. Um, so constraints aren't concepts. We're not aiming for a full concept solution. We're only looking at checking at the point of use. We think that's a good feature to have. Um, you can at least catch these errors before you get into the template instantiation stack. So we're not trying to do template, uh, template definition checking. We're also not trying to change any lookup rules. So the way that you write templates today is going to be the way that you write templates with, con with, with concepts like. The, the lookup rules are almost entirely the same except for some small things that we do to make lookup work with constraints. The same ADL rules apply, the same, the same scoping rules, two-phase lookup, all of that stuff still applies the same way that it did before. One of the things that we actually like about this approach is that it allows uh, incremental adoption, the use of concepts. You don't have, it's not a flip that you have to switch. You don't have to constrain everything before anybody uses it. You can actually constrain some templates in the lower part of your libraries and allow unconstrained, un unconstrained templates at the top. You can write constraints at the top of your libraries close to the interface and allow a lot of unconstrained stuff at the bottom. You're really free. It's, re it's really free to be able to do what you want here. You're not required to turn everything on and off at the same time. Dave? I assert that that's not uh, a capability of this approach. No, it's, it's not. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, I don't know if it was a question, but I'll repeat the comment. Um, that, this is not specific to this approach. Um, the C++ OX proposals did have some features that will allow you to escape the constrained box that you put around uh, templates. And there was, there was a, a, a way of actually checking unconstrained uh, generic lambdas in, in, in C++ OX also. I know the papers you're referring to, but yeah. So it's not, it's not specific to this, but this is, this is a little bit, little bit lighter, I think. You don't have to do any, th any hard work to get this feature. It's just there. Um, Yes. Sorry, the, the, the question is, uh, checking template arguments at the point of use, is that what we're aiming for or what we support? Uh, the answer is yes, both. There, there's more stuff. Um, there, is a library, there is a language migration path towards separate checking. It's just not included in this proposal. But we're, we're fairly confident that we know how to make this work. OK, so constraints. Um, looks a little bit like C++ OX. We can, we can write constraints as part of the type of a template parameter. So I can declare a function called sort, whose template parameter is declared as sortable container, which states the requirements on type C, the template parameter C. This is exactly equivalent to writing it this way. In fact, this is actually how the compiler sees these things. You write shorthand notation, the compiler does a transformation and gives you, gives you this. You never actually you don't have to see that, though. What this says is that, sorry, this is a requires clause. Uh, the requires clause is followed by a constant expression. And what the requires clause says is that this must evaluate to true in order for this to be instantiated. That's concepts light in a nutshell. Yes? Uh, becomes non-viable candidate, yep. Sorry, uh, 
When this evaluates to false, the declar uh, sorry, I'm getting used to repeating the question. Um, what happens when this returns false? Uh, the declaration is not instantiated, the candidate is non-viable, it is not included in overload resolution. Beyond that. So, what does sortable container look like? Uh, that should say sortable container. Well, basically it's declared like this. Uh, we have this new keyword concept that we're using as a declaration specifier. Effectively, effectively what it means is const expert. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, and it's just a const expert function. It returns something that evaluates these properties of, of sortable, right? Type traits, something. So, sortable, uh, yeah, so T is a permutable container, which means that uh, this should be actually random access permutable container because that's the constraint I'm assuming here. So if we declare a forward list and try to call sort, we expect this not to work. Uh, does the, the function run at compile time? Yes, it is const expert. Yes. So when we actually run this, um, we, we expect to see errors. And the errors wouldn't fit nicely on the slides, so I am going to try something bold and actually try to run this. If I can get the right. They always say don't do anything live. Right. Okay, so here's the program. <coughs> Looks like it's a little bit off the center there. So here's the program we just wrote. We have a template, a uh, fun function template called sort has a nice constraint sortable container. Obviously it doesn't sort, but that's not the point. Um, so when we run this guy, we should expect to see nice output. So in fact, what this tells us, shrink this up a little bit, is that there is no match for a function called sort. There is a candidate. This one's called standard candidate sortable container. Um, by the way, I just wrote the diagnostics yesterday, so you can see the, the template constraint here and the way the compiler views it by, by duplicating the requirement as part of the the declaration. So the compiler is actually doing this transformation at compile time. I just forgot to actually fix that before I, before I shipped the patch. It's minor. But what you can see is that it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy the constraints because uh, this const expert function or concept is not satisfied. And more specifically, when you go inside of that, we can see that the square bracket operator, subscript operators are not valid syntax for forward list. So these are the kinds of diagnostics we actually get with, with concepts like. I wrote these on Tuesday, so they're not perfect, um, but they, they are getting better, and I suspect once we go through an official design of that, we'll, I'll be quite happy. Yes, Dave? I haven't seen a subscript operator. I think that's so far. So where does that part of the document go? I was actually going to hold off showing you that for a little bit, but I will go back to the, the sortable HPP that actually includes that. It's not a particularly good concept that I've defined, but it's, it's primarily for the purpose of showing diagnostics. Oh, yes, and to repeat the question, I haven't seen the subscript operator yet. Comment. And I will show it later. So we can also constrain class templates. Um, a vector, the, the object type might be constrained by the, by the concept object or object type. The allocator, obviously, allocator is a concept. Um, again, we do this equivalent transformation. If you don't satisfy these constraints, if these don't evaluate to true, the class template can't be instantiated. We can constrain uh, member function templates. Now, there's a slight change in the, in the syntax from what you would have seen in Bristol. Um, we used to have the requires clause above uh, preceding the declaration. Um, due to some interesting parsing issues, we actually moved it to the back. Um, we actually, actually think this looks a little bit better because now all of your declarations start at the same point in the column, <laughs> which is a really important issue when you're talking about designing language features, that all your declarations start in the same column. But they mean, they mean roughly the same thing. Yes, Alistair? I don't think it's constrained Right, so the comment is that we can't do this today. You actually have to make your member functions function templates in order to get constraints on them. So this is actually very new. You, you can't do this in C11. Um, defining out of body class, uh, sorry, out of class member definitions works like this. Same thing, fairly expected. Um, constraints match against the, the nested name specifier, and the constraints here match against the, uh, the, the function declaration, yeah. Um, a syntax question, does the, is the required stuff supposed to go after any function attributes like cost or no expert or? Yeah, it follows the, uh, follows the re uh, return type, yes. 
does the requires clause follow the um, follow the const or return type specifier, late return type specifier? The answer is yes. So you write everything for your regular declaration, then you write the requires clause. Um, the specification does allow for multi-type constraints being used as shorthand. So for example, if you want to write equality comparable as a constraint it, as part of the template, uh, the type of a template parameter, you can write it like this. The transformation is straightforward. You just take the declared parameter T and you substitute for the first template argument of the, of the constraint down here. I actually don't like this syntax. I, I implemented this with the initial research prototype and then wrote all of the standard algorithms so that it would use this and it turns out to make it verbose. So I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of this particular style of declaration, but it's supported. It, we expect to support it. So what is the difference between the requires clause after template and the one after a function definition? Um, that's actually a good question. So the requires clause after a template parameter list are your template constraints, your template requirements. Those act as a precondition to the instantiation of the declaration. If you look at this, if you think about the instantiation process for class template definitions, these, guys, these declarations are instantiated regardless of whether or not these constraints are satisfied or not. So these constraints are actually instantiated as part of this declaration. So these end up being declaration constraints. And these will actually tell you when you can or cannot use the declaration when you, when you, act, when you try to call it. Um, so there's a slight difference between the way these are actually handled here. Does that, does that answer your question? It's, these, this feature is not very well supported by the implementation just yet. We're still trying to work out some of the, some of the issues in it. Um, but it turns out to be a slightly different model than, than checking constraints for template arguments. So we can overload on constraints because we said we wanted to. Um, so here's a version of advance. We have three declarations, uh, the, the usual version minus, minus the number of elements that you can advance by. Um, these are all different declarations. If we call uh, advance with an input iterator, an iStream iterator, which is only an iStream iterator, we will actually get the first overload. Um, obviously, an iStream iterator is not a bidirectional iterator or random access iterator, so there's only one viable candidate. Selection is easy. If we call it with a list, we have an interesting situation because bidirectional iterators are also input iterators, so we have two viable candidates here. We have the first and the second one being viable. Um, bidirectional iterators are not random access iterators, so this is a non-viable candidate. The way that we actually do this is to modify the definition of looking up the most constrained template, uh, most constrained declaration. So we actually, sorry, most specialized declaration. So we actually look up the most constrained by comparing the template constraints on these guys. I will give you the, the, the math for that later on. Um, you can also, yes, Eric. Can you, uh, back up one slide? Sure. So uh, how do you handle the syntactic ambiguity between input and forward Um well, there's, there's the way that I, sorry, how do we handle the syntactic, dif, uh, the semantic ambiguity between input iterators and forward iterators? Um, the way that I've done it previously is to not require post increment for forward iterators. So you can actually syntactically differentiate them. The way that I suspect it would work for the standard library or some version of the standard library moving forward is that you still require iterator traits. So somewhere in the back end, you have a trait that actually evaluates are you derived from forward iterator? And the, so you can still use traits to, to disambiguate semantic, semantically. So, uh, back, yes, back to this. We, we can uh, partially specialize class templates based on constraints. Um, so here we have a redesign of the complex class, our usual complex number, which is required to take uh, types that approximate real numbers. We can also define a Gaussian integer class, basically complex integers, so we have a different specialization of that here. Um, and yes, these are actually specializations. They're, they're specialization arguments here. We're not trying to overload class names. That would have been a significant new feature for C++ that we would have liked to avoid. So there are some other things that actually show up in the, uh, the constrained uh, N3580 document. Um, in particular, you can constrain alias templates. They're templates, so it shouldn't be very surprising. Um, you can constrain template template parameters, which is interesting. It has some neat features associated with it. We can write variadic constraints. You can you can apply constraints variadically. There's, there's a lot of different things that we can do with this because we're really just talking about const expert functions being applied as almost as if they were you know, enable if. Almost as if they're enable if. Obviously, this set of features is significantly more advanced than that. Okay, so how do you define constraints? 
Well, the constraint is basically just a const expert function. Um, we, we use the, the, the concept specifier instead of concept because we have some other expectations here. Um, constraints can't be specialized. This is actually one of the requirements of concepts. You, you can't have multiple definitions of a constraint for all types. Um, but really what they're used to do is check syntactic requirements. So the kinds of questions that we're actually using, we're, we're often asking in these things are, is this expression valid for some type T? Or is the result of this type T convertible to some, uh, convertible to some type? Result of this expression convertible to some type? Is Larisse? So it's not just a const expert template, correct. Uh, it does have to return bool or something convertible to bool. Um, I think convertibility was requested at some point. Yes. I'm sorry, please, you were asking? So the question is, does a constraint have to be a template um, I will rephrase the question is as, does a constraint have to be a dependent expression, a type dependent or value dependent expression? And the answer is, if you want to do anything useful, yes. Um, re requires false is an interesting construct. Or construct. You can do it. Um, I, I, I think you can actually get useful declarations out of that, actually. Uh, I, just, I, just, I don't have good evidence for that yet. Requires true also. Excuse me. This altitude is killing me. Um, did you have another follow-up question or something? No? Okay. Um, so this is what we're trying to do with constraints. Um, so concept, what, is this, what does this actually mean? Well, if you write concept, your declaration is automatically const expert. Um, we also have some other, some other semantic restrictions on this. You can't specialize or refine things declared concept. We want a single definition of every concept. There's no way to partially specialize that for some types or have some constraints that deal with, con with, with that query differently than other constraints. We have a single definition of a total function mapping from types or template parameters to true-false, effectively. Um, declaration has to have a definition uh, at the point of first use. I think you can still forward declare these guys and then define them prior to the first use. That should be okay. And lastly, the declaration name can be used as a type specifier. This is really the requirement that got, that got concept put into the, the, the proposal, the keyword concept. Um, we, we needed something to disambiguate the use of, of constraint names as, as types later on, which I will talk about in my notation section. So the first pass of, uh, first pass of concept slide actually required you to write type traits. So if you wanted to write the concept definition for equality comparable, you would have to write a type trait called has eek that did some sphene magic and would evaluate return true or false if that expression could compile. You'd also probably want to write some aliases because if you do this the other way and have decal type, you can end up with some interesting problems. Namely, you can get hard compiler errors uh, if decal type doesn't succeed because this isn't a function definition. It is not in the immediate context when you evaluate it. Not a good thing. Um, likewise with has, equal, has not equal and not equal type. Um, so the first pass of, of concept slide, I actually did this. And I had a, a little concept emulation library in origin predating this work by, by several years, I think. And uh, just to get the concepts that would normally be in the standard library, things like regular iterator, output iterator, things and, and such, it ended up being like 15 or 20,000 lines of type traits. Because I, I, tend to, I tend to not write macros to hide all of that stuff. And this just isn't a good way to approach this problem. Um, in fact, when we had our teleconference with the, the concept study group, they said, this is not a good way to address this problem. It's, it's a lot of code. It's hard to read. It's hard to write. It's hard to make easy mistakes in it. And it's slow. When you have to evaluate all these type traits, you're going to spend a lot of time instantiating class templates. And it, it can be quite burdensome. So the first implementation, or sorry, an evolution of the implementation of the compiler actually added a new feature called underscore underscore is valid expert. Uh, and is valid type, which were compiler intrinsics that would actually do a lot of this stuff for you. And the concept study group said, hey, that's neat. Make that a feature. So we did. We borrowed the requires keyword and turned it into an expression. So this is a requires expression. It introduces a couple of local parameters, A and B. This is basically notation that you use to write constraints. Um, 
your, your syntactic requirements are basically a set of statements inside of this requires clause. Uh, each statement denotes a syntactic requirement. So here is a syntactic requirement saying that A equals B must compile when instantiated for some type argument, for some template argument, and the result of that expression must be convertible to bool. And likewise with not equal. So each, each statement here is actually a, a conjunction of requirements also. So this is two. Must compile, must convert. Must compile, must convert. Yes? No. Oh, sorry, can I use this outside of concepts? <laughs> no. We've, uh, we've put some limitations on its use. And, and the real reason for that is that if you, if you try to take this stuff outside of templates and, and make it work in a non-dependent context or not, when you're not processing some template declaration, there's no guarantee that every vendor will actually be able to, to sort of stop type checking, back up and say, hey, your, your expression doesn't actually work. In fact, I can't even get GCC to do this in non-dependent context. Yeah. Oh, I apologize. I misunderstood your question. Can I use it in any template? Yes. It's just a dependent expression. Yes, Dave. Uh, sure. I'd have to write it. Oh, sorry, uh, to repeat the question, can you show me an implementation of the find algorithm using the system? Yes, I'll have to write it. <laughs> no, uh, I'll show you in the next slide. So that's exactly equivalent to, write, to writing this. Um, if you omit the braces, you can actually write an expression by itself. It has the same meaning. It's required to compile. So by the way, I should point out that when you actually write this or this, these compile down to is valid expert constructs, yes. Yes, you can leave it off. You have to, no, you have to put bool there. Yes, sorry. Let me, let me summarize the series of questions. If I write concept, do I have to write bool? The answer is yes. The reason is that if we omitted the bool specifier, then we felt that we were getting too close to a definition of concepts where we couldn't back out of this syntax if we had to. So we're reserving concepts followed by nothing but an identifier to mean here's a concept definition possibly with a slightly different syntax. Yes. No. Uh, can I give this function arguments? No, you cannot. Okay, so this is, by the way, this, this specification is exactly equivalent to this one. Um, all of these things just sort of fall out of that syntax. A equals B is required to compile. Uh, and then the convertibility required is actually written in terms of this convertible concept, which does exactly what you think it would, which is delegate back to the is convertible type trait, which defines the requirements for convertibility in the standard language. Yes. Uh, is, is a substitution failure in the body of this declaration equivalent to returning false? Yes, but not because of the reason you think it is. <laughs> I, will, I will explain that comment, comment later. Um, I promise. Yes. 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 Uh, so the question is, is this an expression? Yes. Can you use it in the body of a requires clause? Yes, but you may not need to. I give an example way at the end where I don't. Yes. How do I determine the most constrained template? I, there's, there's much involved in that. I will explain it as we go. Fortunately, only two slides. David. Um, it is. It's what we, sorry, why, why this syntax? Um, it's just kind of what we converged on because we were, we were sort of following the, the 
the, the conventions of the, the Palo Alto TR, so WG document N3351, had something similar to this, but slightly broken. Um, so we, we changed it a little bit. Yes, Alistair. This one or this one? Yes. Yes. So the question is, uh, if this is an expression, can I put something after it? And the answer is yes. It's just an expression. So you can put ands and you can put ors. Um, I tend to stick my ands up front with this being the last thing. Uh, but yeah, you can do that. You do. You do. Um, OK, so type constraints work the same way. We can just write a type name followed by a semicolon. This is an explicit requirement for the validity of some type under instantiation. If you try to try to check this function, this doesn't instantiate, false. We can also get implicit type requirements. So any type that's named at the back of the, this convertibility thing or result type thing becomes an implied requirement. So if the compiler cannot form this point, this type at the, the point of instantiation, the point of checking, uh, this will also return false. Type requirements. OK, language talk. So this is basically all of, uh, all of Concepts Lite from the point of use. This is the language talk. And I hope there are some juggalos in the audience because I worked very hard at finding that picture. Um, okay, so I will start by saying that this is not just const expert. The idea that the constraints are actually represented as constant expressions is not, not quite adequate at all. Um, there is a formal constraints language that the constraints are actually written in. And it's really just a set of prop atomic propositions that are uh, joined by or connected by and and or. This is our constraint language. Subset of oh. propositional logic. So for the most part, any expression in C++ is going to be atomic. Basically, we have no deeper propositional or logical structure associated with C++ structures. I'm not trying to reason about the meaning of any of these expressions. These are just things that return true or false. The constraint language doesn't care what they mean. They're just true or false. So things like type trait evaluations, is integral t colon colon value, true or false. I'm not going to try to look inside of the type trait and figure out what exactly it means. Negation is also primitive, which is kind of odd because I'm talking about propositional logic and negation is often part of propositional logic. But negative requirements are weird. We allow it as an expression, an atomic expression. It tells me true or false, but I'm not trying to reason about the deeper propositional logic or propositional structure of these things. Um, we could do interesting things with relational, with relational expressions on, on uh, literal arguments, uh, constant expressions here, but we've opted not to. So these are, again, just propositions. They're atomic. They, we don't know what they mean. They just return true or false. Const expert functions also return true or false. Um, this might answer the previous question about why you can't use function arguments, because we don't know the answers for all these, all these things at the point of instantiation or at the point of call. Um, and of course, you can use true or false as propositions, like, like Larissa asked earlier, I think. Um, but what they mean is kind of interesting. Calls to constraints, anything declared concept, are not atomic. We actually reduce those. And the reduced term actually comes out of, uh, unfortunately, lambda calculus. But it's basically inlining. So if I write a concept that looks like this, arithmetic, uh, requires integral or floating point, kind of the standard definition of, 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 of arithmetic here. And I try to use it for a, a cleverly named algorithm called do math. You write this. What the compiler really sees is this. So when you actually write concepts as, as uh, when you actually use these concept declared constraints and, and requires clauses, we inline the bodies of those things recursively. There's a really good reason for doing this. Marshall, ask your question now. Uh, so the question earlier was, if a substitution failure occurs in the definition of a concept, do you return false? And the answer was yes, but not for the reason I explained. Okay. The reason you get false is because we actually lift the def these, these constraints out of the different, different instantiation context and cram it into the immediate context. So a substitution failure occurring inside of a concept check just sphenes away. Actually, that's not quite true. We trap that and say it's false, and you don't even try to instantiate the declaration after that. Okay. So that's why that's one of the meanings of concept. That actually allows this inlining to happen. It turns out to be a very cool thing to do. This is also the reason why you can't partially specialize or, or refine concepts based on constraints. You have a single definition of a concept for all types returning true or false. 
if we tried to split these definitions, we could never actually decide what constraints to pull out of that definition and into this requires clause. It's undecidable. That is also why things like this are treated as atomic, because we don't want to look into the definition of a class at compile time and try to infer the meaning of those things when we're, when we're building up things like this. So that's concepts light, more or less. All of our, all of our semantics are based on this reduced form of, of, of requirements of atomic propositions connected by ands and ors. So how does overloading work? And specialization, yes, Luis. No, oh, so will unconstrained templates behave the same as writing a template type name T requires true? Not quite. Um, true is a constraint. Unconstrained is the absence of constraint. So th there's a subtle difference there. And there's, there's actually a reason why we've chosen to do that. Uh, ask at the end, I will tell you. It's deep. Yes. So we don't specialize concepts. The question is, you, I just said I don't specialize concepts, but obviously these have to be specialized to be implemented, which is not quite true. You can have an alternative definition that doesn't deal with that stuff. But um, these are atomic. I don't care what's inside them. No deeper propositional structure. We don't look into them. They're just true false, true false answers for us. Okay, so, uh, sorry, yes. Is it possible to constrain concepts? No because they're declared concept and you can't specialize or refine them. One definition for all types or all type, type arguments returning true or false. This is, I, I tried this in an earlier rendition of this. It doesn't work. It gives you really weird answers if you try to actually split up the definition of a concept to be different things for different types. Can one concept call another? Another, certainly, absolutely. Almost certainly required, in fact. Otherwise, you end up duplicating requirements. It is. Uh, concepts calling other concepts is a form of refinement, yes. Okay, back to overload resolution. So we've added two, two steps, normally in function overload resolution. And by the way, I'm kind of whitewashing this. There are, uh, as discussed previously in different talks, many, many rules to template argument to our function overload resolution. This is the broad, broad strokes of them. First step is that you deduce function arguments, or you perform template argument deduction. If template argument deduction fails, you have a non-viable candidate. You get some error like function argument deduction failed. The new step that we add here is that if when you, once you've successfully deduced your template arguments, you substitute those arguments into the constraints and you instantiate them, you, see if you can see if you can satisfy them. If this returns false, as we discussed earlier, uh, we have a non-viable declaration. We don't instantiate the, we don't instantiate the template, and we, we, that's out of the overload set. Um, anything else? Yeah, yeah. So, once we've done that and we actually have a set of candidates, we have to look to see which is the best. Um, there are complex rules for this involving conversion sequences. If we have two, if we're comparing two function templates that have, uh, sorry, if we're comparing two valid function templates, we try to find which is the most specialized. If we can't determine which is the most specialized, or specifically find which is equivalently specialized, we then try to find the most constrained. So is it possible to check constraints, have it return true, and then have instantiation fail? Absolutely. But if you do that, you have been deceitful about your constraints. <laughs> you have written constraints that do not adequately reflect the, 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 the requirements of your template declaration. I mean, if you write your requirements correctly, you should, it should imply that your instantiation succeeds. If you don't have that, then, then you've just not captured the requirements correctly. In other words, you have a bug. You have a bug. <laughs> yes. Can you repeat that?
so to summarize the, the, the comment, uh, point of instantiation, sorry, the meaning of a concept may change based on different declarations being present at different points of instantiation in the program. There's a possibility of that. I don't know if it happens in practice. Yes, I, if we can if we can construct an example that actually demonstrates that, I'd, I'd be happy. Okay. Okay. Constraint satisfaction is actually really easy. Uh, it's it's just constant expert functions. We evaluate them. We have a nice engine for that. Um, the C plus plus fourteen extensions for constant expert make this particularly interesting because you may actually in the future be able to evaluate standard library algorithms to actually check concepts. Um, so if you really want to, you can build, build a Turing machine, const expert Turing machine. Uh, I don't suggest, I don't recommend that. Uh, another one, yes. Oh, there, there are multiple? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I'm not recommending you do this for concepts, but you certainly could. Somebody will. Um, Finding the most specialized is actually kind of interesting. Again, I'm going to whitewash this, this process a little bit. Um, effectively, what you do when you're comparing two function templates is to uh, try to perform mutual deduction against each other. So you try to, try to deduce the arguments from some function f1 from the arguments of f2. And if you can, then f2 is more specialized. Maybe I got that backwards. Uh, and then you do the same thing. And if you can do that, f1 is more specialized. If you find that both are more specialized than the other, then they're actually, they actually have equivalent type, equivalent generic type. Um, if you find that neither is more specialized, then you just have an ambiguity and you can't do anything about it. In the case where the types are actually known to be equivalent, then we look at the template constraints and we do that. And the way that we do that is to actually find the most constraint. And I didn't actually have this part of my presentation, in, in, in part, I didn't have these slides in my presentation until I sat through David's, David Sanko's talk and Larissa's talk and decided that if I'm going to explain this, I will do the math. So it's going to get mathy starting in the next slide. But the basic rules are, if we have two constraints, gamma and delta, we say that gamma subsumes delta if and only if all of gamma's, if and only if gamma contains all of delta's propositions. Because remember, these are just propositions, lists of propositions. Sorry, expressions containing propositions. Now, the real solution to this is actually as an application of first order, uh, sorry, this should say propositional logic. We're not dealing with first order logic. That's not decidable, it turns out. But you can really easily think of this as a subset problem. In fact, if you don't have any disjunctions, this just is a subset problem. Um, so more broadly than that, if we have two declarations, A and B, with equivalent type, these should probably be template declarations. A is more constrained if its requirements, gamma, subsumes those of B, delta. And unconstrained templates are always the least constrained, which is why if you actually require true, you get something that's more constrained than an unconstrained template. It's a weird, weird artifact of the definition, but it's something that we actually have in there. I don't remember the definitions of the C++ OX proposals that well, like to the, to the level of detail that I understand this, so I'm probably not going to answer questions on them. But this is the mechanism we're using for Concepts Lite. It's very nice. Ready for the math? Here we go. Okay, so first thing we do is actually, this is basically an application of sequent calculus. Sequent calculus is developed in, I think, roughly the 30s, so this is not new technology. Um, it's used for doing backwards proofs and propositional first order logic. So what happens is we have this reduced language. We're talking about propositions with and and or, right? Actually, let me, let me back up a little bit. I forgot I was going to explain the notation here. I only added these slides last night, so this is a little bit unrehearsed. So what does all this mean? Well, this is a turnstile, and what it means is that we can derive the thing on the right, delta, from the thing on the left. Syntactically, it's a syntactic consequence of the thing on the left, essentially. So. <coughs> The things on the left and right, these are just going to be lists of atoms. Gamma is a list of atoms. Delta is a list of atoms. So what we're actually asking is, can I find in gamma 
all of the things in delta. And if I can find in gamma all the things in delta, or some things in delta, I should say, then we know that we can syntactically derive the validity of delta from things on the left. If you guys have done type theory, this is actually not fundamentally different. It just uses expressions instead of types. Um, P and Q are actually expressions in this case. They may or may not be atomic propositions, but they're C++ expressions. Um, these rules are applied from bottom up, working re uh, recursively. Uh, and here we have conjunction and and disjunction, or I tend to write them in terms of the mathematical meaning because uh, of habit. So, hey, that's not right. Okay, so what happens is that if we have an expression, a conjunction of requirements and P, uh, P and Q, we basically decompose this on the left-hand side, so we basically create a longer list of requirements. We're essentially registering things with our context that we're going to show things about. Now, this, do, these decomposition, this decompos decomposition is done for every template declaration that has some constraint. Always. This is always done. Whenever we have some disjunction, we kind of do the same thing, but it's a little bit different. We actually have to branch this into two separate sub-problems. So we, we make a copy of our current list of uh, known expressions or known atoms. We insert the left operand into the first one, the right operand in the second. Now, these are basically setting up a logical problem, right? So for anything that we're actually going to try to prove against, we're going to actually substitute something for delta, and we're going to try to find evidence of delta in these lists of propositions, these subsets of, of propositions. It seems difficult, but if you work a couple examples, it's really easy, very easy to see. Uh, so. What happens when we actually go to compute most specialized is that we've already run a, a left-hand side. So these are called left decomposition rules because all the decomposition happens on the left-hand side of the turnstile. There's a very nice Wikipedia on this article on this also. So when we actually go to check for most specialized, we take a pre-decomposed uh, left-hand side gamma. So this is just going to be the list of propositions for, for some function template. The, the requirements have been fully decomposed. And we're going to do the same thing on the right. So when we find an expression, an and expression, we have to find in that list of propositions that P can be, that P is there. Syntactic comparison. D, can you find A equals B in A equals B? Yes, of course. So therefore, this is valid. And then we do the same thing for Q. So can you find in gamma evidence support for the validity of Q? In other words, can you find one expression inside of another? If so, then this is a viable expression. This is a valid expression. So you can, do, you can actually derive, sorry, P and Q can be derived from this list of expressions. We do the same thing for disjunction, except it's a sequent calculus, so we get to cheat. We, we lift the arguments, and if you find one, and then uh, find one or the other, then you can, you can actually derive that, that fact. Um, this is not really the way they're implemented. We don't actually do a full decomposition on the right-hand side. We do do a decomposition on the left-hand side. Really what happens when you actually run this is that you have an expression, an AST node with an AND in the middle, an AND node. You say, can I find P in the context? Yes. Can I find Q in the context? Yes. Okay, true. Done. Recursively applied. Um, same thing with OR. Can I find OR? If so, short circuit and fail. Um, so it's just, it's just a search algorithm, and you're, you're running over syntactic matching. But it's all about entailment. Uh, sorry, syntactic consequence here. And if you go back and read Elements of Programming, um, somewhere, I forget what page it is, somewhere between 6 and 11, Alex actually gives a definition of concept refinement in terms of satisfaction, which is exactly what's happening here. Um, so one concept C prime refines another concept C. If whenever C prime's requirements are satisfied, C's are also satisfied. That is exactly that definition pushed into propositional logic. Yes, Dave. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Abrams, Abrams. Yes. Yes. Do you need to normalize these expressions to make this work? No, you don't. The nice thing about sequent calculus is that you don't actually have to normalize anything. The decomposition rules will actually guarantee that you have these sets of propositions in place. Um, so, so a logically equivalent thing in a different form will still get Yes. Only if the syntax only if the syntax of the sorry, let me repeat. Uh, two logically equivalent things expressed in different ways may be satisfied if the underlying syntax of the, of the propositions are, or are, are uh, derivable. Uh, 
Um, I think the next slide actually works an example, but it uh, works an example of it. Okay. So I think so. It's probably not, it's not a very big example because they tend to get a little large. Yeah. You're right. If I was going to do a full presentation of sequent calculus, I would actually show bars over these when I found matching terms. Yes, but I'm, I'm not. It's just, these are just the decomposition rules. It's not a full exposition of sequent calculus. There are really nice tutorials out there on, there, on this. this is, by the way, this is not hard stuff to learn if you're really interested in learning it. Um, I, I had to learn this in December to actually make overloading work, and it's only been, what, five months? So it's easy to learn. It's easy to implement. The core implementation in, in GCC is probably all of... 500 lines of code, and it's GCC. So if you're in Clang, I would expect that to be 40. <laughs> right? Yes, Larisse. Uh, ideally, it's very reusable, because as we're moving forward, we're actually doing a lot of this stuff with semantic checking. Sorry. How reusable is the implementation? Uh, sorry. Obviously, it's bound to GCC. I have to deal with GCC internals, so I have this weird tree structure that I have to deal with. But it is, it, as far as being reusable within the context of that program, it's very, very, very reasonable. It has to be, because we're actually using this, this mechanism a lot to do a lot more interesting things, like actually checking semantics of, of, of expressions, um, which is sort of an extended and complicated version of what you're seeing here. But the implementation is essentially a, mi a small theorem prover sitting inside of the compiler. I, I can't speak on stealing implementation. There are licensing restrictions and stuff. It's open source. I don't want to poison, poison your, your licenses with, with GCCs. Um, but you can certainly look at it for inspiration. It's, it's fairly clean um, and hopefully really easy to see what's going on. OK, uh, where were we? OK, so two concepts, advanceable and incrementable, not written in terms of each other, but just written in terms of basic requirements. So advanceable requires plus, 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 plus I. Incrementable requires both plus, 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 plus I and I plus, plus, right? So the question is, does advanceable subsume incrementable? I? Oh, I, I, I left that this, off. So I saw X and I. <laughs> magic variables, man, magic variables. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I've coding at its best, right? Better? Okay. So here we have, I'm missing a return statement. Jesus. This is <laughs> new slides, new slides. Okay, so assume a return statement, uh, please. Otherwise, I'm going to go off the edge of the slide, and that's just no good. Um, so we have one requires I++ plus plus or plus plus I. That's just a single requirement. The other requires both I++ plus plus and I++, plus, uh, both the pre-increment and the post-increment, right? So the question is, does advanceable subsume incrementable? Now you can actually break this down and do it in a nice sequent calculus way. Um, if we had whiteboards, I might actually do that, but I'm allergic to chalk and I'm not going to. Um, but remember, remember what I said, if there's no disjunction, this is a simple subset problem. So is it, are the requirements of advanceable a subset of those of incrementable? Who votes yes? Good. So advanceable does not subsume incrementable. The superset relation is actually what you're looking for here for, for a subsumption. Does incrementable subsume advance? Who votes yes? It had better be one way or the other. There's, there's, it's a subset. Like you can match up the spelling, right? So here's spelling matches. This one doesn't match. So you can find a subset relation fairly easily. Um, I will point out that if the, they both subsume each other, then they are equivalent. And that's actually how you handle redeclaration in our, in our language. So when you have two declarations with constraints, you actually break them down into a two-sided comparison on it. OK, no questions? Good. Okay, notation. Oh, I'm sorry, David, did you have a question? The question I have is, you're using this and you're getting this, this subset of all the different relations on these things, but it's all syntactic. Yes. It's no, it's not. So I just wonder, in real use cases, if you care more about syntax than syntax, how does this... Uh, okay, so the question is, how does this apply to semantics uh, moving forward from syntax? And... Um, I will probably oversell my colleagues' work on this, uh, but essentially, it 
it's sort of an extended version of the same thing, but the logical system has to be a lot more complicated. So you actually have to deal with things like universal quantification, existential quantification, maybe, possibly negation, which is just kind of weird in terms of these constraints anyways, but maybe not. Um, hopefully we don't get to the point of having to deal with modal logics, that would be awful. But there, there are ways of actually doing this syntactically. Um, so we can actually do semantic checking syntactically based on the same basic mechanisms, but plus a lot more operators. And I think the basic mechanism of that will be an assume statement. So you assume some properties of objects, and that gets registered in, in your context. It just becomes a list of things known. And so when you actually go to verify, verify the validity of some expression with respect to that context, you have to look it up and you do some kind of syntactic match or some, some weird decomposition of these things to figure it out. Yes? No. Um, the, the, the comparison at this particular level, so the, the question is if I change the names of these variables, does, uh, do, will they still compare equal? Um, I want to say no. Uh, I want to say that these expressions are written in terms of uh, sort of name independent comparisons. Uh, I haven't found that, I haven't actually exercised that problem yet. So I don't know. I suspect the answer is going to be no for the moment, that they will be different but I, I have yet to figure out if I actually want them to be different or not. So I don't know. It's a good question though. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. So uh, a template that is more constrained is a better match for, <coughs> for overload resolution. Um, and by the way, I, I don't have this in the, the presentation yet, but the same, same principles apply to class template specialization. You have the same mechanisms for instantiation, satisfaction, and uh, lookup, uh, ordering. Yes, Dave. So, given that generic programming is fundamentally all about algorithms, I know that we haven't looked at any algorithms yet. So well, I really like to use an algorithm. Um, when I asked about fine, you said I would have to write it, but don't you have any in the Um. Do I have an implementation of the standard library and why haven't I written find? I did have an implementation of the standard library written in terms of the, the initial prototype and decided that I would not actually do that. Um, it turns out to be fairly invasive under the standard library, so I've kind of backed those changes out. But there is a version, you can actually find a version of these patches, I think, that, that has those constraints in there. Mike. Are you show us I can show you algorithms. Um, but I will go through my presentations first, or the presentation first. Mike, Michael. An unconstrained template is an empty set of constraints, yes. Okay, notation. This is where I expect to see some people grimace. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about these things. Thank you. Um, okay, so in C++14, we get the nice edition called variable templates. Uh, some people didn't appreciate this one. I actually quite like it a, a lot. So one thing we can do is instead of using numeric limits to get our minimum values, we can describe a template variable, uh, context, sorry, a context per template variable, variable template, and then use that to write things like min, int, min, unsigned, gives us the right answer. It's a nice feature to have. Can anybody guess why I'm putting this in my presentation? There's exactly one reason. There are two small reasons why I'm putting this in here. No, it's so I can get rid of parentheses in my concept names. See, look, equality comparable, no parentheses. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. Well, that, so the, the comment is that this won't work because of, a, of an ambiguity. It, uh, it will not because you can't actually have a variable template and a context per function declared with the same name and the same type. So there would only be one definition of this and it's not going to be ambiguous in lookup. Yeah. Um, I am not the first person to point this out. I think that uh, Walter Brown actually proposed doing something very similar in his, his proposal for object alias templates. In, uh, it was also submitted to Bristol. Okay, um, generic lambdas also show up in C++14. Uh, so we can do this. 
uh, we can actually pass a functor to sort. It takes two auto-declared parameters, types of these vary based on the instantiation of sort and the types of these arguments here. It's a generic template, uh, generic lambda. Uh, result type is deduced, of course. Also a C++ 14 feature. Unfortunately, there, there's sort of a long-term interaction between, between concepts and uh, generic lambdas. Um, eventually, we'd like to have separate checking for templates. It's, it's just something down the road that we think we'd like to do. Um, unfortunately, generic lambdas that went into C++14 are unconstrained. And there's been some concern that the widespread use of unconstrained generic lambdas may lead to breakage when you enable separate, separate checking. Like you forgot to write the requirements for totally ordered in your, in your template for constraint. Uh, your, your, your constraints for this, this function f, right? Um, so in that case, if you have separate checking turned on and you try to parse this, you're going to get an instantiation error somewhere deep inside of sort and it just becomes a late caught error. But we'd like to make it, we'd like to be able to catch these things at the, at the point of use. Yes? I tend to agree. No, it's not. What's an archetype? No, but we know how to solve the problem. It's actually very close to what you're describing. Um, I'm actually not concerned about this. I don't think it's a big deal. I think there's a solution. We know we had one that could have worked for C++ OX. I think there's an equivalent solution that'll work for separate checking for concepts light. We just don't have the, con the, the notion of an archetype here. But hopefully it's not a big deal. Re Yeah, I agree. Okay. I agree. So you don't need to something like this. I was not proposing to, but thank you. Okay, so what we'd really like to do is have constraints for generic lab lambdas, just in case you decide you actually need more constraints on your lambda than you announced in your your, your template. Right. So we end up with a problem here. Lambdas are kind of terse notation. Um, templates aren't. Lambdas are also functions, so whatever works for lambdas, we think should also work for functions. You guys can see this in the late de uh, deduce result type, return type for, for, function or for functions now in C++14. So things that we're trying to do for functions for lambdas so are slowly propagating up to functions also, which means we're going to do some very interesting things with function template syntax. Um, Bjarne's observations on this was that from day one, uh, most people have complained, so sorry, some people have complained that template syntax is a little bit verbose. Um, you know, he's observed that novices want loud syntax. Even people that are working with new syntax want the, want the syntax to be loud and obvious so that it exposes the new features. But after time, you know, it gets repetitive writing all these things and you just kind of want to write fewer characters because you know what it means and you're starting to develop carpal tunnel syndrome, so fewer characters is better, right? So we actually like more terse syntax for all of this stuff if we can get it. Notation actually matters. Um, so what we're trying to do is optimize this notation for constraints for the common case here. So this is clearly not the right way to write constraints. Um, really not going to work for lambdas, if you, if you think about it. Um, that's just awful. So one of the things that we can do is we, we use sort of predicate abstraction. We basically build these higher level predicates that wrap the constraints that we need. So we have something called mergeable that expresses exactly the requirements that we need for the merge algorithm. And we hide all of this ugliness. Predicate abstraction, good word. All of that goes away, hidden. Still means the same thing, by the way because we inline all this stuff and we decompose these requirements. And if we were going to do this for lambdas, we might actually think about doing it like this. Declare the parameters and have this requirement and then, uh, uh, oops, this is going to maybe be parsed as a, as a function application. So that's not going to work. There seems to be a, a syntactic ambiguity here. So how do, we, how do we get around this? Well, I'm waiting for the cringe. What we can do is we can use a concept to introduce a set of parameters all at the same time and constrain them in one shot. So Mergeable might be used in this concept list, and it's followed by what looks to be an initializer list of template parameters. Um, and basically, that just introduces the same template parameters you saw previously here, and applies the constraint mergeable as seen there. That's all it means, just syntax, shorthand. No, no deep semantics to it. So we can also do the same thing with templates or with lambdas. We write mergeable, uh, mergeable here. We introduce our, our three different type parameters, and they're going to be automatically constrained by this. And we don't run into that weird syntactic parsing problem. And you can write your lambda that looks like the signature of merge, but your lambdas probably don't look like it anyways. So maybe this isn't the greatest solution for this particular lambda. But you'll run into these problems eventually. 
Uh, Dave, I think you were up first. Uh, does it work if this first and second arguments are the same? Uh, we'll discuss, show that later, I think. Um, let me know if I don't answer, answer your question when I, when I get there. Yes, David. Dave. Are, are you only doing this for sort of language? Consistency through the language, and we, we think that there will be use cases for constrained lambdas in the future. I think so. I wrote one. Where did I write that? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's gonna. So, what does what does what do constrained lambdas actually improve about about C plus plus? Well, if I can write constraints to this, I can actually check the definition. I know I can check the definition of the lambda the signature lambda at the point of use for sort. I don't have to do any hard work to figure that out. You know, if I, if I write that a, X and Y have to be, you know, totally ordered, then that constraint gets checked at the point of, at the point of instantiation of sort or overload resolution for sort. And so I get an early caught error when this is instantiated. Not if you constrain it here. Because that constraint has to be evaluated as part of the signature or before it gets passed into uh, the sort function. And again, I'm, I'm kind of speculating on this a little bit. We haven't really worked out the semantics for it because we don't have a version of constrained lambdas for, sorry, generic lambdas for, C, for GCC yet. So I can't give 100% precise answers about how this will work, but I can say what the notation should look like, what I think it should look like. Yes. Which one? This one. I don't know. Does does this work if I put type? Does this work if I put type name or int? Uh, answer is I don't know. We're still kind of working through the, the the details of the notation. We're presenting it because this is what we're going to include in the TS. Some version of this. So there's a question up here. Well, uh, so, right, the, the, the comment is that we can't actually write real semantic requirements on these things, and we never propose to. We don't do it now. We document that, right? So what we can do is we can use syntactic requirements to emulate, sort of emulate the, the, the semantic contract between the developer of the concept and its user. So that's, I mean, that's just what we have to rely on for now. Maybe that'll change in the future. We'll, we'll see. I have my fingers crossed. Okay. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so the, the, the actual meaning of this is actually uh, probably just showed you in the previous slide, but you take the introduction, the introduced template parameters, you rewrite them in a parameter list, and you, you replace the concept as a, as a requires clause. So it's, it's not semantics, it's just new syntax. Um, type concepts are fun. So a type concept is basically a single argument concept, although I suspect it could be a multi-argument concept with some default parameters or default arguments. You can do that with concepts. Um, but we get to use this with our shorthand notation. So we can write sortable container C and require that. But we can also do something very nice, depending on what you think is nice. We can just use that concept as the name of the, the parameter itself. And so now we can just get rid of template altogether. And so sort is actually a template because it introduces. Oh. Yep. <laughs> I was waiting for it. It's a constrained placeholder type. You guys don't like this? It's a template. It's just a generic function. Uh, functional programming languages, functional programmers have never had any problems with this. You just define an expression, it becomes a function, you put in the types, and if it satisfies the requirements, if you can build it, it does. So that's not an existential type. It is not an existential type, no. Okay. It's not an existential type. I'm sorry, wait, what was that? Good 
maybe I'm not understanding existential type as clearly as I should. Okay, well, so I mean, we can, we can probably talk about it afterwards. Because um, I'd, like I'd like to hear what you mean by it. Okay, I think you had a question. Sure, or you could use auto. We have auto lambdas, right? Why not just write auto here? Were there other questions? I know I saw also a couple hands up, I thought. Default type? Uh, what do you mean default type? Well, default arguments are a little bit different. Um, I think we can still have default arguments for constrained types as long as the default argument actually satisfies the constraint of, that's been applied. To. Um, I'm not sure where default type applies here because there is no default that you can actually get out of this. Yes? So one issue I have with the is now looking at the search, I cannot tell if it's on So from the point of use, if I call sort, Forget that I'm doing any of this. I'm just calling sort. How do you know it's polymorphic or not? Period. For any overload, for any function call, how do you know if what you're calling is polymorphic or monomorphic? You have to look at the overload set. So you mean, so you're saying where sortable container would be actually be like an abstract base class kind of thing? Kind so of. kind of? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I don't, so I, I will actually comment on that because I've thought actually very deeply about how to do this. Um, you don't want this to be what you're talking about. Because every time that we actually have some kind of virtual table that gets involved in these things, we use the keyword virtual. Right? Where, where not? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're getting a little bit off track, but y y we're getting a little bit off track. But there is a virtual table in there. I will get to that answer briefly. Okay, so we can do this with lambdas also. Um, this, is actually, this is actually not bad for lambdas, um, but the same principle applies. What we declare here, we can actually write as a concept declaring the constraint there, and now whatever we pass into this must actually be required to be a regular type. Not sure what I'm doing with the, with the capture here, yeah. Same type problem. If I have two arguments that have the same concept, we assume that they're the same type, basically. This is the common case. We think this is the common case. So the idea is that because their type names have the same sep spelling, we think that they should actually be the same. This is not the same as writing auto twice, where you're allowed to have freedom of, of, of substitution there. Yes. You use a longer term, use longer hand syntax. So, which actually answers the bottom of the slide. But the, what this actually means is this, right? So you declare, you write it this way. When we, when we actually run through it, we, we pull the random access iterator out, it becomes a the, the constraint. You write uh, an implementation defined type name, R. And so anywhere inside of this scope where you saw random access previously, you replace it with R. So if you actually, where was that? So to answer your question previously, um, when you, when you want to get the iterator type, you can write, random access iterator, colon, colon, iterator, and that substitution will automatically replace it with the, the built-in type name. Yes?
Uh, we've spent many, many hours discussing whether or not this would work or how it could work or whether it was the right solution. And what we ended up with was this is probably the right solution for a common case. Okay. Done with that stuff. Unless there's other questions. Yes. Um, I think the generalization of generic lambdas would allow that, yes. The, the question was, can we just write f as a function f auto something, returning something, and have everything sort of be deduced and magical and a template? I think so. The generalization would, would seem to indicate that, yes. David. Or you could be clever and call it type. And so now you don't have to write type name anymore, right? Save four characters, just add a shift. OK, so yeah, <laughs> there is a problem with that. Um, I, I, at one point, I had suggested just putting the word auto in here to say, add a degree of freedom. Here's a constraint, but still deduce an auto. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's going to happen. We'll see. This is, by the way, we're fairly comfortable with the underlying mechanisms for these things. Um, it's, it's going to go into the TS, but the TS is not actually part of C++. It's an extension. So you're under no obligation to use these things. It's really for you to try to figure out whether it works for you in this case. OK, so two implementations. There's an initial prototype uh, based on GCC 4.8, which was last rebased in September. Uh, there were some nasty regressions that prevented me from updating that. The new official GCC branch is actually called uh, C++ Concepts. Uh, on the page I showed earlier. Uh, this, is, this is merged with Trunk fairly recently, I think like once a month. So this is actually up to date and you get all the 4.9 features and, and regressions. Um, there is library support. Uh, I basically forked my library origin and decided I was going to rewrite everything in terms of, of Concepts Lite. Um, so I've been doing that this week and a little bit last week. It does have algorithms in it. Uh, it is built against the current GCC branch. Um, the compiler performance is actually pretty good. In Bristol, I, I ran uh, a little test comparing essentially concepts light versus emulation. So if you actually had type traits that were doing all the enable if and kind of asking for all these things, how much performance do you get from using concepts light as opposed to uh, emulation of type traits? And the answer is, uh, as far as I can tell, linearly increasing with, un with no upper bound. The more constraints you check on more types, the more improvement you're going to get. So in GCC, class templates tend to be expensive, and their instantiation is kind of expensive. So the less class templates you actually have to deal with, the faster your compiler actually runs. Um, one of the reasons we actually get this performance is that we're taking a lot of things out of the standard library that, that have library implementations and putting them into the compiler. There doesn't need to be a library implementation of isConvertible. The compiler knows how to compute that on the fly, and it should. So the, um, I'm sorry, yes, question. Give me the example after the talk, please. Um, OK, uh, library support. So I think this is still true. I wrote this slide uh, several months ago, but it should still be true. Basically, it has all the constraints from Palo Alto. Um, this is, this is the, the, the initial concepts meeting from 2010. Yes, Therese. Yes, it is then some. Um, and some small variations. So all of these constraints were actually developed. All the concepts for these, this, this library were developed at the Palo Alto meeting. This was chaired by Alex Stepanoff. Sean Parent was there. Larice was there with her advisor, Andrew Lumsdane. John Kolb was there. I was there. Bjarna was there. Sorry, John. Uh, my, uh, Paul McJones was there also. So basically we sat in a room and figured out what kind of requirements we actually had to state for the standard template library, specifically the algorithms, and ended up with a concept design for this stuff. Yes. Docu documentation? What? <laughs> <laughs> They're implemented. Um, but I, 
I will say that the core concepts in, uh, sorry, do the concepts presented in origin uh, faithfully adhere to the design presented in Palo Alto meeting or the N3351 document? More or less. Um, in, 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 in essence, the core concepts will be the same. There are some different names, but not dramatically different. You won't usually be using things like indirectly swappable or advanceable to write your, your, your algorithms. You'll use regular and, and, I don't know, mergeable. You probably won't use mergeable very frequently. I don't know how many more merge algorithms you want to write. We would, yes. We would break C++ code if we required regular everywhere. I don't. I believe that is true. And I don't think we actually did require regular in the Palo Alto TR anywhere, um, except in a very few instances. But I can't remember off the top of my head. There's, there's, there is a nice document. You can actually go and look those up. So how much did we pay attention to backwards compatibility in the Palo Alto meeting? Um, I think we tried to be backwards compatible. I think there were definitely some algorithms where we decided that backwards compatibility would not, would maybe not have been the best idea. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, I think it mostly conforms, but I don't, I don't know every instance where it doesn't, off the top of my head. I think we actually documented where it shouldn't or where it doesn't in that paper in the 130 pages of that document. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, how easy would it be for you to figure out the closeness of fit between my concepts and Palo Alto? Uh, you're going to have to go through and compare by hand. I don't know. You have to look at code, yes. Michael, do you have a question back there? So the question is, have we thought about constraining non-templates and namespaces and other, other declarations, right? Um, it's not included in the technical report or the technical specification. So we haven't, we haven't worked on that. I, I know that Walter Brown asked a question about a one point, so I suspect that he will at some point move forward with something, um, but we're not, it's, it's out of the scope of our, of our work here. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead and talk about this problem because I have like five minutes and I, I this is my favorite problem to talk about with constraints because it's fun. Uh, it turns out that constraining templates has this nice side, effect, side effect of quietly, quietly rerouting overload resolution. And, uh, thanks to John for helping me find this, this beautiful example. So it's John's fault that we have this solution now. So if I have this program, uh, I have a double and I have a template and I call f with zero, it's going to call this because I get an exact match, right? There's no conversion sequences. The template turns, about to be better, turns out to be better. But later on, I come, to, later on I, I come along and I realize that what I really want is this function to actually be an argument on characters. So now I have an interesting problem because my original call, well, this won't be viable and int is not a character type. That's viable, there's a conversion sequence. So instead of calling something like two upper, I might call sign and just get weird answers and I don't, I don't think that's what we want. So the question is, how do you actually figure out, how can you get the compiler to tell you when it's going to reroute your calls? When you're going to quietly change the meaning of, pro of a program by adding, by adding a constraint to a template. And I will point out that this is not unique to adding constraints. You get the same problem when you add templates too, it's just kind of the dual of that. Templates are greedy, they pick up overloads. Uh, Constraints turn out to be generous. They will, they will give them away. So how do you get the compiler to actually fix this? And if you saw this presentation in Bristol, do not give the answer. Yes? Um, anything, you, anything you add that changes the meaning of your program when you don't expect it to can generally be a bad thing. Yes, Alistair? You're right, I agree with that. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't write it correctly to begin with, so I deserve to be punished. Is that about right? <laughs> no. 
Not true. Overloads can include constrained and unconstrained templates and non-templates. It will happen. I actually wrote this up and ran it as an example when I was in Bristol. It happens. Yes, Dave. I'm sorry. To try to rephrase what Reese and Alistair were saying, I did not understand why you expected to not change what gets called to change the signature on the overloads. The question is how do you prevent that from happening? How do you make it noisy? Yes. Yeah. Why not? Delete the unconstrained function. No. This is a beautiful thing. Unconstrained templates are easy or evil. They're greedy. They, they pick up everything. Just delete it. Yes, I am. That's why I like this example so much. If you pass a float now, it's an error. No. Oh, yeah, right. Actually, if you did pass a float, it would be an error. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just wanted to point this out because you can actually delete constrained functions also and templates. It's a nice, it's a nice technique to have if you actually want to delete the unconstrained version. Instead of having an unconstrained version that's undefined. Yes. So, I think, because I think uh, there was some miscommunication there. And this is an interesting technique. If yeah. Say, okay, I'm going to constrain this whole unconstrained template, and I want the compiler to tell me about all the code that now no longer goes to template. And I can do this. I change my program response. Yeah, absolutely. I think they've got the impression that you want the compiler to enforce that this no. has no, I, I'm not suggesting the compiler automatically generate this. I'm, this is a library technique for, for preventing overloads from going to unconstrained cases. Yes. Yes. And that's. Sorry. The, the, the title of that initial slide was an evolution problem. I, didn't, I don't think I probably, you're right, I didn't say that quite clearly enough, but yes. This is an evolution problem. This is something that you do as a library writer to detect these kind of things. And that's actually a good thing to have. It's, it's a, it's a huge I would not suggest that the compiler do this at all. This is not a good idea. <laughs> because then you end up with the other case where the compiler quietly rejects things that would actually work. Like, if the compiler generated this, you would fail float conversion. But if you add it as a library, you have the freedom to take it out later. OK, um, briefly, conclusions. Concepts light is roughly enable if, but on steroids, we basically get overloading and nicer, diagnos nicer diagnostics. That's actually the right way to think of it here. Uh, it just relies on cost expert. It builds on existing features and practice. Um, the formal semantics of, uh, is, uh, is actually rooted in theories of formal logic and languages. So this, is, this is a sound extension of, of the language. Um, future work, uh, basically in the next few months, months implementing the Tersh template stuff and the constrained generic lambda. Uh, actually, I probably won't do constrained generic lambdas. I will do the Tersh template stuff and introduction syntax. Um, I, I do continue, uh, aim to continue working on, on Origin and hopefully some other libraries and, of course, writing this technical specification of which I'm apparently the project editor. So, questions? Yes, Dave. <laughs> oh, unfortunately, I'm out of time, but yes. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so this is... Um, so you guys for find. I don't have the, the standard find algorithm. This is my, my, my range adaptation of, of what, it, what it looks like. Um, that's kind of dark. But I don't know how to turn it up. Yeah. Oops. OK, so. Um, Origins range library is basically a simple uh, wrapper around the libraries. Uh, a range is essentially begin and end. Um, 
constrained to be a range search, which is actually defined right above it. So again, uh, using, using sort of this predicate abstraction technique to, to make the, the constraints simpler and readable here. Um, yeah, so this is what they actually look like. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. This is part of origin. Live programming during a talk. No better way to. This is not the best angle for typing. Okay, algorithm. I'm trying to I'm trying to decide if I compile the compile this. Will it um, will I get an internal compiler error? <laughs> I suspect not. Yeah. I, I'm starting to sweat a little bit. Oops, gotta build it. So far so good. Coming up. There it goes. Find. Okay. So, great. Okay. Now, I claim that the implementation of find is broke according to your previous description of who's responsible for what and the bugging. Is that so? Well, right. I mean, this is something where, where, where se uh, separate checking kind of plays. Um, or you can make library fixes to actually get around it. So if you go and look at the way that C GCC actually implements all of their standard libraries, wherever they actually evaluate something that is convertible to bool, that requires that, they wrap it with an explicit conversion to bool. Right. right? So. so if you want to be 100% precise, you can do something like this. Um, maybe that. Right. Yeah. I'm not, there was no claim that it wasn't important. There's just not a claim that, there's, that it's in the scope of the, of the, of the work. So, um, yeah, so this does tend to be a bit, a bit problematic. And we, we think we know how to solve it when we get to separate checking. Um, but we're not solving it now. It's just, it's out of scope. For concepts light, it's out of scope. Uh, because you can actually rewrite the expression when you find a match for it on association. Okay. 
I, 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 I'm not suggesting to. I, I don't. I don't see that implication. It doesn't seem to follow to me. Other questions? No. Anybody back here that I'm missing? Okay. Yes, Larice. Final question. Yeah, send it to me. I'd like to look at it at length, make sure I understand it. All right, thank you.